So hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, today, Annette and Julio will present us their work on the uh, microgrid. So Annette graduated in uh, in the uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, she got a PhD in system innovation. Then she joined uh, Sony CSL Tokyo, and she spent some time also uh, in Paris as a researcher. And Julio is also a researcher at Sony CSL Paris. He studied uh, applied mathematics. He got a PhD in applied mathematics and uh, worked on uh, data analysis for biology, statistics for biology. And he is now working in the creativity team uh, at CSL Paris. So I, I let you the stage. OK, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Yeah, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and be, being able to present uh, what we've been doing uh, last year. Um, so yeah, I've mostly I've, I, I, today I will talk about microgrids as a future proof solutions for electrification. And Julie will present a case study uh, that we did last year. So. I have been working on microgrids for almost a decade and uh, in different different countries, different areas. And some people ask why microgrids? And I just think microgrids are a very elegant solution to have uh, energy consumption and generation happening at the same place. And in that sense, they are viable solution nowadays, but also in 50 years or when we will have a very high penetration of renewables. And actually, I think there's two, two main problems that microgrids can help with. One is climate change. So uh, you know that renewable resources are distributed. It's not like a coal-fired power plant that you just build somewhere where you need the, the power. Um, the wind and the sun, it, it's, you, you harness it where the wind and the sun is. So renewables are very distributed, which makes them very different um, which makes a very different energy environment than what we've built in the last century. On the other hand, the other issues that microgrid can help with is energy access. Um, so there are still hundreds of millions of people who don't have electricity access. And these people live often in distributed areas, uh, in rural areas difficult to reach. And it's really hard to pull a wire there and electrify them. And uh, um, that's also where microgrids can come in very useful. Uh, just to give you an idea of how many people still live in, uh, in off-grid areas. So in 2010, it was 1.3 million. Now in 2020, well, last year, it's 500 million less, which is great. And if we follow the goal for SDG 7, a Sustainable Development Goal 7, uh, we should reach universal electricity access by 2030. However, it seems like uh, there was a study that says that if we continue the way we have been doing with electrification, there will still be 674 million uh, people that will not have access to electricity by 2030. And that is because the remaining people that don't have electricity, they live in these remote areas, difficult to reach, and you cannot reach them with the conventional business as usual approach. Fortunately, in the last decade, there have been a few trends that are game changers. Um, one of them is the decrease in price of solar power and batteries. It's seven times cheaper now than 10 years ago, which means that if you bought a solar panel 10 years ago for 100 euro today, it will cost 15 euro. That makes a big difference in being able to build a business around it. And the other big difference is technologies. Uh, nowadays, we have smart metering, mobile payments, and IoT solutions that are available at a relatively low cost that can help us to build a business model around it. And these three trends have enabled um, one big disruption that is called solar home systems, which are these small systems, a small so solar panel and a battery that uh, have been deployed at the hundreds of millions in Africa and, and, um, and Asia. Um, and, a lot, and been really a game changer for the people who live there. They can have power, clean, power, clean lightning now. 
don't need to use kerosene lamps anymore, can charge a mobile phone, uh, which before they had to, you know, travel 25 kilometers to charge it. They can charge it at home. So these solar home systems have really been game changers for the rural population. However, there is one issue is that they, they can't really grow. Like what if you need now more power? What if you want to have a pump? You cannot power it with these small systems. And I think that's where microgrids come in. Microgrids are really at the intersection between um, these small, relatively low-tech uh, solar home systems or solar lanterns and a, a real infrastructure that is scalable and that can help these people to move up the uh, energy ladder, what we say, which means to help them move, uh, get advantage, the, all the advantages from former electricity, including productive appliances, which allows them to make actually money with, for example, a pump uh, and, and being able to run a business with it. And for that, you need higher power system. And microgrids could be one of the things that provide on one side the infrastructure and on the other side also be affordable and be able to deploy them remotely. And in that sense, I, that's why I use the term future proof in the title. It's actually not my term. It comes from the World Economic Forum from a white paper where they say, in addition to being an economic solution to energy access now, mini grids enable developing countries to future proof their power network with a more distributed smart distribution network comparable to the one being built in developed countries. Um, so if we look at these microgrids, these off-grid microgrids that are built somewhere where there is no electricity, they are really a blank canvas because they are not connected to the main grid, which means if there's many days without sun, you will go into a blackout. They're also not connected to a wholesale market. You can't just buy additional electricity, what you would do in uh, developed countries, which means you don't have any price signals. You don't know how to price a kilowatt energy of power, which might not be the same thing during noon than it is at night. So it's really hard to know how do you build a case around that. And so at Sony CSL, we're trying to make it to build a data-driven approach around that. And the first thing we look at that is the different types of topologies. Uh, so initially, the first renewable systems that were deployed in, in emerging countries were the independent solar home systems that we saw earlier. But then now we see more microgrids and we see two topologies, centralized topologies and distributed topologies. The centralized uh, microgrids, I, sh I show you an example, it will be clearer. Uh, like this one in India, where you have uh, like solar panels that are deployed, usually heavily guarded for, for not, having, not, not getting them stolen, in the center of a village, and then some wires are pulled to each house. On the other hand, very different approach is um, distributed microgrids. Uh, this is a picture I took in Bangladesh, and you see the rooftops of, uh, these are actually solar home systems. Bangladesh has the highest penetration of solar home system with over 5 million systems deployed. And what a company called SolShare did is that they said, OK, there is all these solar home systems out there, uh, but they're not used optimally because the problem with solar home systems is that they're limited. The battery is relatively small. And if you have a very sunny day, you might be able to generate more electricity that doesn't fit in your batteries. Um, and so in that case, that excess energy is wasted. And what they did is that they connected the solar home system all together so that you can actually provide that excess power to people that couldn't even afford a solar home system, for example. And so it really allows the population to buy or to sell the electricity from their own solar home systems. Another way of building a distributed microgrid is this one in Cambodia, built by a company called Okra Solar that has microgrids in uh, Cambodia and the Philippines and now expanding to Africa. Um, the thing is that in Cambodia or the Philippines, people didn't have so many solar home systems. So what they did is that they said, OK, let's install the solar home system ourselves. And the, the people, they only pay for the power that they use. And uh, in order to avoid that there is energy that is being wasted, uh, when, for example, the sun is shining, but the person doesn't consume, let's connect them together and basically share that excess energy. And, oh, sorry. And 
So the thing is, the whole question is, these are very interesting models that are happening now and there's more and more uh, different uh, startups coming up. However, um, it is still difficult to scale these microgrids and there is no one that has really managed so far. And most of that is because eventually in order to really scale and make like hundreds and hundreds of microgrids, you need to have a business model and basically make more money than what you spend. So we also looked at the business model and there is also many different types of them. Um, there is uh, some companies that sell energy as a product where you basically pay every day a little bit and then until the, you own it. This is for solar home systems mostly. But you also have leasing models where you pay a daily fee. And finally, the more complex models that are coming up now, they require a meter uh, to measure how much electricity you consume. And there you have uh, primarily two models. One is energy as a commodity where you pay for the amount of electricity consumed, a bit similar to what we do in, in, in developed nations. Um, but you also have more innovative uh, approach like energy trading. This is what SolShare is doing where you can actually buy and sell electricity in both directions. Now there is, from, from what I have seen, there is no real winner, there's no really better solution. It really depends on the environment you are. And it's really hard to know uh, which approach would work better. And one of the reasons why that's so hard to know is obviously the diversity of the environment, but also the lack of data and data-driven approaches and objective analysis, like a third parties analysis. I mean, this data about these microgrids is very difficult to have. And often uh, the only studies we get are actually from the company that are making the microgrids themselves. So, well, we thought, okay, what if we team up with them and provide a third party analysis of one of the microgrids? So we teamed up with Okra, um, the company that has microgrids in Cambodia and the Philippines. And they provided us with a really nice set of data for a, for a microgrid in the Philippines. Um, Julio will explain more in details about that microgrid. But before that, just to put you a little bit in, in, in the right set, in the right mood, I'd like to show you a promotional video of, of, of the company that we worked with. Um, it's, it's a bit old, but I think it will still show, um, give you an idea of what it looks like and what they are doing. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see and hear the video. It's 2018. One in six people still don't have access to power. We are Oka. And we provide power. Oka is an innovative way to set up microgrids in the most remote parts of the world. Our distribution partners install solar energy through the community and connect systems together using Okra, turning them into smart grids. Power is shared between the houses, meaning people have more energy for all their needs. Lights, phone charging, fans, TV, pumping water, even for rice cooking. Our partners love Ogre because it's so easy. Our software manages every aspect of our networks. Mobile payments, maintenance and scaling, network updates and upgrades without stepping foot in the field. This is important because it can take days to reach the communities who need power. With Okra, people don't have to wait anymore. The power is brought to them. Okay. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Okay. I guess I'll, and I'll pass it on to Julio for the case study. More details on case studies. 
Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. So, so do you see, do you see my, screen? my screen? Yes. yes. OK, perfect. Um, Annette? Yes? Maybe I hear myself from your microphone. Yes, I'm going to mute myself. OK. Oh, OK, or headphones, it's fine. Thank you very much. So, OK, uh, thank you, Annette, for your presentation. I uh, will now take over uh, describing what work we've been done together uh, on a case study. Uh, we analyze the data and run some simulation to trying to assess the impact of, uh, of sharing in this specific microgrid. So uh, this is a microgrid from Okra. Uh, it's set in the Philippines in the island of San Isidro. It's made of a uh, clusters of 62 households. Its household is a, a solar home system and therefore is equipped with a battery and a photovoltaic panel. And the, these houses are then connected in clusters. And uh, we have data uh, spanning from for one year since uh, uh, July 2019. So each household uh, are, are subdivided, belongs to one of the three customer types, either entry, basic or productive, uh, in order of in increasing order of their uh, panel and battery capacities. Uh, each customer pays a certain fee to be granted um, an, a day, daily allowance of energy that he can exploit. So first of all, uh, I will discuss a bit of the data we have and we start from the payment rates. Uh, we find uh, that overall there is a good payment record with an average of 6.5% averaged over all the households. Uh, and this is in the face of uh, an average of 50% allowance exploitation. And as you can see, energy that have productive appliances um, are the one that most exploits the, their, their allowance. Uh, also another thing you can notice here is that in, during good weather weeks, the energy is much higher, the consumption is much higher than bad weather. Uh, and this is mainly because uh, during good weather, the temperatures are much higher and uh, people need in this island need fans, uh, cooling down system and especially productive households typically have a cooling system for to, to preserve fish. So when the, the, the temperature is higher during the good weather time, uh, the energy consumption is higher. Now to give you an idea of the data we had, here is a list of uh, average uh, a list of uh, of data we have uh, average over the units we actually have this split by um, households so first of all we have the actual generation so the amount of uh, the, the, the generation we have the amount of consumption uh, per household load the how much energy is then shared to and from the grid and then from these we can infer how much energy uh, produced is then uh, lost, wasted during the transmissions. Uh, an additional measure we have is the amount of uh, how the, the battery state of charge, which tell it's a percentage that tells us how much battery is uh, is, is uh, capacity is. Sorry, the uh, how much is charged. Um, so 100% is fully charged, and we typically have that about 50% is when is actually is a discharge level. So one of the data we we do not have is so this is the uh, the actual generation, which is different from the theoretical generation because lacks of the amount uh, the amount of energy that has been curtailed and therefore wasted. So we could instead infer the theoretical generation, which is the actual generation we had before plus uh, the curtailed energy, by um, using uh meteor blue data uh for for irradiation for solar radiation and then we thanks to a simple linear equation we managed to uh provide uh, uh to approximate what is the theoretical that what was the theoretical generation in uh, our grid uh, here this is an example of how it's um how well this uh, theoretical generation fits with respect to the actual generation. As you can see, the, there is a wide variability. The gray area is the mean, is the area between the mean and the max of the, 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 the generation over the capacity. 
uh, over all households. This is a this is quite variable. And also there are uh, other issues with respect to uh, the, um, uh, the, the theoretical generation. Here you can see it in pink, what we estimated, and this is the energy I uh, showed you before. Uh, here is a sample for uh, one week in April. As you can see, we have times where our um, theoretical generation is much lower than uh, the, the generation we actually observe or vice versa it's or, or it's the other way around this is probably likely due to inconsistencies into uh, we, we found there were a bit some, some inconsistencies in the irradiation data with respect to what was actually generated uh, i mean they, uh, they don't always match but they still provide one of the best approximation we can have with respect to um, the theoretical generation so we'll stick with it uh, so now we move to um, the actual analysis. So we know that microgrid connection uh, enable energy sharing, which reduces the curtailment of excess energy and also balances the energy demand with these excesses. Although uh, there haven't been many quantitative studies on this matter, and that's what we wanted to uh, investigate. So to understand the impact of energy sharing in a microgrid. So to do so, uh, we first define some key performance indicators, KPIs, uh, to quantify the status of the grid. So the statistics that measure the status of the grid. And then using an agent-based model, we try to simulate different sharing scenarios, uh, none real and ideal. So none where there is no sharing uh, between households. Uh, one is more realistic that it mimics the exact uh, situation uh, the, our case study and an ideal where we assume that all households are connected to each other without any loss during the energy transmission. And we will use these and uh, then on these three different scenarios we'll be able to be compared thanks to the uh, key performance indicator to understand how much uh, the sharing is an improvement from uh, the, the standalone scenario where there is no connection and how and the ideal will offer a uh, upper bound for what could be the actual improvement from the current uh, the current status. So this the KPI we define are the following. We have utility, uh, that is the load, uh, this, this uh, load as a percentage of the theoretical generation, and efficiency, which is the load as a percentage of the actual generation. And I recall theoretical generation here is corresponds to the actual generation plus the curtailed energy. Uh, then we have uh, the percentage of blackout hours, the percentage of load that was not met, therefore load deficit over the requested. And then we have other indicators as the average state of charge, the standard deviation of the state of, of charge, uh, which is a good indicator of the variability of the, the, the state, the, the level of charge of the battery, which uh, the, the standard deviation of this of the state of charge uh, correlates with lifetime of, the, of a battery, and that's why we included it. Then we have the curtailment, then as a percentage of the theoretical generation, and finally the amount of energy shared over the um, consumed energy. So, uh, to define our agent-based model, we first had to simulate each uh, household as a unit or agent of the model. Uh, we used all the coefficients and the, and the parameters we had from the case study uh, and even the, the same uh, connection between households. Uh, so the, each unit uh, needs uh, two inputs, the radiation data that were pro to, to calculate the theoretical generation that are provided uh, from uh, the, both from MeteoBlue and then the actual load, which is uh, so the, the amount of consumption for at uh, the interval time we seek to simulate. So the idea is that we feed the radiation data. Uh, this is transformed into a, theoret uh, a theoretical generation. Uh, the amount of en uh, generated energy is then balanced, needs to balance the, the load, which is another input. And then the, the, the generated energy will balance the load with the uh, energy stored in the battery and then any uh, excess energy is then transmitted uh, from the unit to the rest of the grid 
or uh, if there is some um, uh, deficiency of energy, then a request is made to the grid to fill that uh, deficiency. So this is the unit, and then we move up at the, at the grid level. So what the uh, during the simulation one step at the level of the grid, we have all each units will provide an amount of energy that the, uh, an excess energy or uh, some request of energy. And here we basically at the level of the grid, we need to model our three different uh, sharing scenarios. So standalone, simply no connections means uh, that if uh, a household is sending energy, it, no energy will be um, taken from it. Uh, so in that case, the, the entire excess energy will must be curtailed. Uh, we have the ideal scenario where here units are all interconnected one another with no transmission losses. And in this case, if there is uh, the, the, the total ex the excesses uh, and the requests are summed together and they are exchanged proportionally, which means that if there is a total excess, for example, that is higher than the total energy request in a given time in the grid, then the, all the requests are, are satisfied. Uh, these are subtracted to the total excess and the remaining excesses are then uh, redistributed proportionally to the households uh, that were that provided the energy uh, and, and the, this proportional uh, and, and sorry and this uh, uh, and this is proportional to uh, the amount of excess that each household had at the, at the very beginning. Uh, finally, we have the real scenario, uh, which again tries to mimic this uh, uh, this uh, proportionality uh, idea. Um, in this case, we have that not all houses are connected to each other, and therefore uh, things get a bit complicated. For example, we might have that some uh, households are connected to others, and you also need to take into account the, the distances and the resistances in the grid in the in the transmissions. So it's a bit. Uh, we, we 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 made this approximation where we split the grid into micro cluster, uh, uh, where each cluster contains only one excess unit that provides excess energy, and the split is basically do, done by uh, splitting a node that needs instead to receive energy. Uh, it's split into as many nodes as um, excess excess units that is in contact with. And the these new virtual units uh, uh, will request energy that is the sum of the initial node energy requested, and they are proportional to uh, each one of the uh, units that are connected to it that instead have excess energy to provide to it. Uh, it's a bit complicated. I, I know. I will. I, if you want, I am I'm happy to. Uh, get into the detail um, later during the questions. And again, basically in this virtual step, uh, energy is again exchanged proportionally, but this time with losses. And this splitting in sub uh, in subcluster procedure is done iteratively until there's no more exchange possible. And then uh, this ends the, the iteration of the simulation for a given interval of time. In our case, one hour. So that's to give you an idea of the simulation performances. Uh, indeed, this is a model-based agent. Uh, sorry, this is an agent-based model, and the the performance are assessed qualitatively. We most look at the direction of the curves and how the peaks, uh, synchronicity, and height. So here are two examples for two days um, for two entry-level households. Uh, is we have the full lines response to the simulated data and the dashed line to uh, the real data. Uh, these are fairly good. We see here is a bit different. These lines are a bit different, but this day, for example, is a bit better. Uh, we have a basic uh, household, for a basic customer type uh, here. Uh, looks much uh, looks much nicer. We can see that the battery power uh, it's very nicely um, recovered in the model, um, and also in here we have an example of the productive type. It still looks quite nice, although for example, 
a, a pro, an issue that tends to affect specifically the productive level households is that uh, the, the the state of charge of the battery is quite different from what is recorded in reality. Uh, but bear in mind that sometimes the state of charge is not uh, super reliable, uh, the measurement for technical reason. Uh, so in the, so now we have basically four different um, um, setups. The one from the real data, and we have three that have been simulated, cluster being the real one, the one that is close to the, the realistic scenario. So what we can see here, we measure the KPIs and some indicators. We immediately see that uh, the KPIs between the measure scenario and the realistic simulated scenario, they're quite close, uh, suggesting again that uh, the, the simulation is quite good. Uh, and also we have that clustered is always, the, the KPIs for the cluster scenario are always bounded by the standalone scenario and the ideal scenario, which makes sense. Uh, we, the only exception of the efficiency, uh, but that's, that's a bit of, um, that there is a good reason for this. The efficiency I recall you is uh, the proportional load, so the, the, the percentage of load over uh, the actual generation. And now I recall you that for all of these three scenarios, uh, the load and the theoretical generation are the same. So what changes from the standalone with respect to the class and ideal is there is much more um, uh, curtailment. And therefore, the, 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 no, the denominator here at, um, that in, in the ratio for the efficiency, which is load over um, actual generation, is lower than the, than the other two. And therefore, and this justifies standalone efficiency lo looking higher. Uh, so one of the most striking results here is that uh, we find, in the end, a small difference from a standalone scenario with respect to uh, a cluster. So as if saying that there isn't much, uh, we see, we see again sharing the balances. We know we know the sharing balance enable the, the balance of the heterogeneity in the grid, but the generation, given the generation and the load are synchronous between the units, we don't really see. We only see a moderate benefit. So we were wondering why. Uh, I mean, again, it was kind of. Um, intuitive at the beginning, because if we had all the um, all the units that are producing and consuming at the same time, well, there is this, the, the system is quite homogeneous and therefore given, given the sharing tends to balance heterogeneity, it was not really, uh, there, there isn't much gain to, to, uh, to have thanks to sharing. So we were wondering what, uh, where are the heterogeneity then? And the first, Thing to check is definitely the differences between uh, the different customers. So this is what we looked. We checked the the KPIs uh, average over the unit types, and here we have you can see in bars uh, the the cluster scenario, the cluster scenario, and with the crosses the KPIs for the that we could measure from the data. And in this case, uh, we definitely see. That for that is okay again a good approximation of the KPIs by the simulation so even at the um, unit level uh, but definitely the there is there is a uh, increased um, there's a good KPIs uh, for the productive units so now to check if this improve mm, the, if there is a benefit from uh, the standalone what we did is. Uh, we take we take the standalone as a reference zero, and every KPI is then subtracted. So every KPI from uh, um, um, the cluster scenario, which you can see in the bar here, is subtracted from uh, by sorry by the standalone KPI. And the same thing here for the ideal. Uh, in this way, uh, a bar plus its whisker can tell us what is the improvement from standalone thanks to uh, thanks to sharing. Um, this is for the bar. And then uh, thanks to sharing in an ideal scenario. So what we can see here is definitely uh, there's better KPI for productive units uh, that is 
induced this this improvement is induced by entry and basic uh, units uh, sharing their curtailing energy and you can see here the share is uh, pretty la pretty big for uh, entry and basic and then you can see that uh, utility will slightly improve uh, all across all three uh, the curtailment is largely reduced for those that share a lot of energy and then in general uh, load blackouts and, and state of charge indicators in, are improving. So this suggests us that uh, this indicated that sharing is essential to the powering of, of productive appliances and this is great because this shows that it's actually supporting local the, 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 the develop, development of a local economy and which is one of the key uh, requirements for this technology to be uh, widespread and to provide a solid and future-proof electrification. So we have this indication, these results that uh, indicated both very good, perform, uh, very a good impact of uh, from 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 sharing and. Uh, yet a marginal one that we observed before and we so we wanted to understand a bit a little bit more uh, uh, into this so uh, Annette uh, recalled a study uh, that she did uh, when she was in Japan uh, where they were again comparing the, the, the standalone uh, scenario against the sharing scenario in another grid for a totally different setting and we noticed that um, the, the there is a Thanks to sharing, there is much more improvement with respect to the standalone scenario, typically when uh, the generation is very close to the load level, which is indicated in this plot from this red area. Uh, but our microgrid is actually, we have a generation that is about three times the amount of load and the battery that needs to last for about two to three days, and uh, placing us in, in, in the study that they did around here where in fact we see a marginal uh, improvement from standalone thanks to sharing. But for a, for a microgrid, this, this overdimensioning, it's necessary because uh, it's the only way to face a streak of bad weather. Uh, if, we, if, we were not, if they were not uh, setting up a grid in this way, uh, the, the grid would be very little reliable and blackouts would be much more occurring, especially when then you have a few days of, uh, of bad weather or storms that especially are a problem in uh, in, uh, in the Philippines, for example, during uh, August and September, if I'm not mistaken. So we 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 want we wondered whether we could exploit this overdimensioning, um, and given we had the simulation, we then try to change, which uh, we, we try to. Uh, increase the load level to reach ge the generation level and do the other way around, reduce the generation level to, to up to the load level. And here you see by simply by multiplying the amount of load and the amount of energy, the, the amount of load consumed, uh, the energy consumed and the uh, energy produced. Uh, what we saw is that as this, this trend happens, uh, the, 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 the KPIs improves and uh, supporting what we observed and we were expecting from the plot before. Again, this is not possible to uh, multiply, to, to, you know, to, add, to add a load that's three times the current or to reduce the, the, the PV panel size up to one third uh, because that would reduce massively the grid reliability. Uh, so this suggested us that there are some improvements that could be done uh, from uh, in the current setup to better exploit this overdimensioning thanks to uh, the sharing. So one would be to, this is what we propose, to the addition of a flexible load uh, that could absorb the energy from the connected units, uh, especially so think of uh, um, a pump or a well that could pump water, for example, during uh, particular, during very good weather days, or where there, where there's, when the batteries are full and in a village, that could be very useful and it could be turned on and off uh, as desired. Or during, especially this possible during the planification phase of a grid, one might uh, design and plan for uh, different energy sources. For example, adding a small wind turbine or this generator uh, that could then sustain and help the um, 
the, 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 the energy production from the solar systems and it could possibly run uh, you know uh, even during during the night or during uh, when there's a bad weather so I've concluded and just want to give you a brief summary uh, uh, we know the microgrids as Annette uh, showed us are becoming an essential technology to enable off-grid electrification uh, so in this context we developed a framework to quantify microgrids performances uh, using the KPIs and to evaluate different setups and scenario using uh, an agent simulation from an agent-based model. Uh, we assessed the benefit of energy thanks to sharing, comparing uh, realistic scenarios to a standalone, and we found a modest improvement due to, to the low heterogeneity but the remarkable support of productive units. Uh, leveraging the grid over dimensioning, we then proposed an addition of flexible load or energy source diversification uh, as a way to increase the system heterogeneity and stability, and again, thanks to Sherry. And I've concluded my presentation. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, me and Annette will be happy to uh, take them. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Maybe I can start with one for um, Julio. Uh, can you show again the raw data you showed at the beginning? Sure. Uh, here. Yes. So there are two two questions. One is uh, sometimes there there are big drops. Is it some microgrids failure or very bad weather condition or uh, can you comment on this? Sure, uh, thank you actually. So as, as you see that it, it, sometimes it's a very noisy. We have for example here at the very beginning was the period when the microgrid was being built and probably tuned so there's a huge variability and this is this data were uh, in, a, in a sense very poor. Uh, I'm not sure about many spots. Yeah, I there think are there still there is typhoons, typhoon time. So okay. whenever you have a big drop, it was because of a typhoon um, that came in or so, and for a few days there was no power. So, or, yeah. If, if I recall the, the part of typhoons, we also had apparently the, the, exactly the missing part. So August and September of last year, they were awful in that sense. Unfortunately, we don't have those. Uh, but all these variability, as you see, uh, with, with our simulation, we focused on one of the most stable months because we didn't want our data to be spoiled by that, uh, by by uh, other accidents, say. Uh, so we only focused on April uh, for the simulations and to assess the uh, to, to all the analysis we've done. Yeah, sometimes there were some some they were doing some tests, so some of the spikes spikes could also be from that. So. And here we also had another oddity is if you look into it, we have the basically the amount of uh, energy that is put into the grid and the amount of energy that is taken from the grid do not sum up to zero, which is this gray, this green line that is almost always uh, zero. So here they were probably doing uh, some some testing. OK, yeah. I think we also got a question on the chat uh, afterwards. But David, do you have another question? Uh, yes, but I can do it after a question of the chat. Okay, then I'll go for the question in the chat. There's someone asking uh, if we were using any existing frameworks. So the thing is, we only did the data analysis, right? So the data we received was from Okra. And as they said, they did the systems themselves. So we didn't use any framework on that side. Uh, and uh, for our simulation, we, we you know, we ran it on only on our side. We didn't use any framework as it's not our microgrid. Okay. Okay, then I had another question. Uh, it seems that the losses are, uh, are uh, bigger than the shared energy. Definitely. Uh, this is actually, this makes sense because there is a, uh, a part of the losses is due to transmission. Actually, we can check it here. Uh, so 
the, the, the losses type is typically we have uh, a bad irradiation. So we are an irradiation coefficient that is lower than one, but that's not technically a loss. Uh, the loss comes from uh, using the battery. Sometimes the, the energy from the battery uh, is not 100% efficient. Uh, we are, yeah, the battery efficiency, we, we estimated it to be 85%. We have the conversion from uh, it, to send the, the energy to and from the grid, it's about 90% efficient. And then we have transmission losses. So those, when there is sharing, we have all these parts of losses that is, uh, that needs to be accounted for. It might look big, but if you look at uh, end-to-end losses, even in our grid, um, we have quite big percentages as well. So um, just to put it in context. I think it's here. And do you know how much is due to transmission? What percentage of the losses are due to transmission? Uh, I think we calculated it, but it was very small. It was actually negligible to compare to uh, compare to the other losses. Um, first of all, the conversion losses is, is uh, bigger than the transmission loss, uh, and even that conversion loss compared to the other losses is also. But I mean, the other black like battery losses, knowing that we are using lead acid batteries, um, it's it's still that's the biggest losses. Uh, so transmission is is relatively small. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, thanks again, Julio and Annette. And uh, thank you for listening. Next week, we'll have uh, um, a seminar about uh, AI for social intelligence. So I hope to see you there. Goodbye. Thank good you day. for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.